let's welcome Jonah Hartstein, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Great to have you. Um, so I'll just give you a one minute background. We're looking at a book uh, from 1918 called Noga HaTzedek, which was published by an early reformer. Um, again, a lot of the language is anachronistic, doesn't necessarily mean reform like we see reform. Um, and in it, uh, there's several Orthodox rabbis um, who are writing Chuvot, uh, basically pro-reform Chuvot. Um, but what is reform at this time in 1819? Uh, they've already built the first temple in Hamburg, but it really means prayer in German, um, having an organ in the synagogue, and um, the uh, abrogating the uh, silent Amidah. All of which there are halachic grounds for, and actually the reformers bring all the halachic grounds. Um, and so here uh, he has, uh, this is uh, Rabbi Aaron of Khorin, who was the rabbi of Erd in uh, Poland, in um, Hungary. And, um, and he says, uh, yeah, there's lots of halachic grounds for uh, prayer in a language other than Hebrew. The Rambam certainly says that clearly. Um, and he says, maybe you'll say that it's bidi evid and not l'chatchila, maybe before the fact that you be in Hebrew. So I would say that, no, that's, that's true. If you understand Hebrew, then you're right. You should pray in Hebrew. And other languages would be a bit of it, the after the fact, would not be as good. But uh, if you don't understand Misheno, uh, Maven, but if you don't understand uh, Hebrew, so then you definitely should pray in the language you understand. And again, we have halachic sources for that. As I said before, also from Sefer Hasidim, it sounded like from Sefer Hasidim, it's even better. Now, here's the part where he really sort of changes his, his flow. So, you know, it's interesting. The early reformers, they're writing to these rabbis and they're getting answers back. They don't know what they're going to get. You know, from Rabbi Rekanadi, they got, uh, you know, who they asked, you know, do you pray in other languages? He said, no, we don't, you know, we're in Italy, we don't do that. Uh, but if you want an organ, there's lots of grounds for having an organ in Shul. Um, and, um, and, and certainly halachic grounds for that. The, uh, but, and, and so over here also, I think they don't know exactly what they're going to get from Rabbi Horan. You know, it's not like, you can't get on the phone with him and say, you know, what do you think? Um, so, uh, so he says, um, he says the halachic grounds for having prayer in any language, which we've seen others, right? But then it's interesting, we haven't seen this, we haven't seen people distinguish necessarily between different parts of prayer. Um, and so he says, yes, psuke de zimra, if you want to have the, the psuke de zimra up to, you know, baruchu, you want to do that in German, that's fine, that's probably a good idea, people don't understand it. But he says, kriya shma shma, and the amida says we should not change it. Yana, tfilos ha'elu, mekablos, these are mekubal, and it's not that hard for us to do, to learn what the words mean. And, and you don't want to, um, you, you, you don't want to change, you it might easily, you might end up changing the structure that Chazal created for the Amidah and for the Shema. And, um, and you don't want to do that. And if you change the language, you might end up doing that more, right? Now, obviously, the Amidah is what is tefillah. That's what Chazal did create for tefillah, for prayer. Um, he says, look in the Rambam, um, uh, Ram says that the Anje Chanechsagdola specifically created, men of the Great Assembly specifically created the Amidan structure that they did because it's it's the right structure. Um, and that is Lashna Kodesh, that's in Hebrew. Uh, and Hebrew is very praiseworthy. It's what God spoke to our ancestors, he gave the Torah in. Right, so here he's saying, you know, Hebrew is very important. And interesting, he says here, we are looking for, we are hoping for the ingathering of the exiles to return our malchut. Now, it's, it's interesting also, by the way, the reform, early reform did not think that. 
they took out the parts uh, about about um, about the redemption. And that God should rebuild the base on Mikdash, because and and there we're going to talk Hebrew. We're going to pray in Hebrew there. Ezra was such an important figure. He was like Moshe. And he he's saying he's saying that he was responsible with the men of the great assembly for creating the Amidah the way it is. If you don't have to, you shouldn't change it. Show to Echad, because of one stupid person of Shnayim and Tzambir that are in a city that don't want to hear and they don't want to study, uh, you're going to give up our, our tradition from the men of the great assembly. So he sounds pretty from here, by the way, right? Now, that's, uh, I think the other thing historically that we want to do is put our finger on who is he? Um, is he somebody who's a traditionalist? Is he somebody who's a reformer? But that's always the question. I showed you that small piece from Mark Shapiro about uh, Rabbi Moshe of Kunitz. And, you know, is he a reformer? Is he a traditionalist? So it's very hard to know. That's the thing. You know, we're talking really early on. It's not like you join a movement. There is no movement. You know, it's, it's 1819. Um, you know, they built the first reformed temple. Uh, things are emerging out of the Enlightenment. But what does it mean to be, you know, in or, you know, this is, I mean, it's akin to today, right? In orthodoxy, there's a whole spectrum. So I think you had that then also. Um, and a lot of this, as I mentioned yesterday, is also reminiscent for us, I think, of arguments today, because those who, the reformers are arguing very halachically. And the traditionalists are usually arguing, you know, the Chassam Sofer is usually arguing, not necessarily halachically, but you know, sort of the slippery slope arguments or the how can you change tradition arguments? Um, because a lot of things in, in pure halacha, it, you could do all these things. But, but it's, so it's interesting where he falls out. He doesn't just throw his lot in with what the reformers want to do in Humber. He says, um, he says, you know, Hebrew is very important. The Messiah is going to come eventually. He says all these things. And, um, and, uh, and he says, okay, Pesuket de Zimra is one thing, but not the Amida and Kriyashma. Of Pesuket de Zimra, Chadam Hashem, Shirim, and this is not a bad distinction, like the Amida is Tfila, and that was what Chazal created. Um, the Shema, obviously, is from the Torah. So what's Pesuket de Zimra? It's Tehillim. What is Tehillim? Tehillim is poems that King David wrote. So that's not, that's not crazy to, to say, you know, for that, you want to really understand it. And for that, don't need the exact language. Uh, I mean, you could make, I guess, the opposite argument also that if it's tefillah, do it in your own words. If it's a poem, you're going to lose a lot if you translate it. I don't know. He says, but psuka de zimra, now maybe he's also trying to, you know, sort of shore up a, a boundary here. Um, you know, he knows more. He knows more about, he's Eastern European, he knows more about the reform movement that's coming than, you know, Rabbi Riccanati from, from Italy, uh, who answered before, seemed very naive. You know, when it comes to sheer, when it comes to poetry, um, David created the Tehillim for people to say as Shira, as poetry and praises to God. Um, so when David created them, he created them because he knew people knew the language um, and they could get the inner sense of it and they could have the sense of the Shira in their heart. Uh, that it should cause for them that it should inspire the Hashem. It should be desirous for God what they're saying. But in our time, he writes in, in 1819, nobody knows how to understand what David wrote. He's saying nobody understands the Hebrew language, right? This is definitely true. I mean, you know, the, the, it, who, who understood Hebrew? The Enlightenment and, 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 and rabbis. But the Amchad probably only understood Yiddish. No one's going to get what King David wrote in Tehillim, you know, if they don't know Hebrew. 
ועל הדרך הזה שאנו עטו מספרים בו מהם אותן ברדיפה והעברה מן השפה ולחוץ. And you know, all we're doing now is we're just saying them on the outside without any feeling in the heart. Tam mahu omer is a good line. Uh, the simple son, what does he say, right? In other words, he's quoting from the Agada, but he's saying, Tam mahu omer, the simple child, which is the Jewish people, mahu omer, they don't know what they say. Vlid, pilus on nefesh, and there's no inspiration. Karov tabifim rochu, man, quotes psukim. And so he's saying basically that to say to Hillam in, in a language you don't understand, what does that mean? That means nothing. Um, he says there's another terrible thing. He says people don't even know how to pronounce the words. And so they pronounce the words tachas tehila. Instead of the word praise, they put tachala, uh, so, you know, illness, destruction. Tachas tefila, and instead of the word prayer, they put tifla, which means, you know, tiflis, like uh, silliness, or shem uh, So he's saying not only do people not know Hebrew, they don't know how to pronounce it. Um, and so he's making the argument that, that even though he wants to retain the Amida and Kriyashma in Hebrew, that it's definitely a good idea to translate the... Um, <coughs> The Hebrew of Psychism or into, in this case, it would be German. Shamar Shemet Kalav, it's very much made. Lahadra Lomam Shalalavu, the Hir Pas Sham Papa Mala, Kmoshavi, the Vrem Shalchanarach, the Anish Samalev, Shakola, Zerot, Ela, who will be a Mayam, Shal Kapanam, a Buckingham's Powell, with my Atme, the Alashan, and Sarah Mishaino Buckingham's Powell, that's a Bishmia, Abu Bazmanenu. Now it's true that you could just listen to the prayers and be yotze. It's just today people just sing with their lips, um, and nobody understands the language. They're praying anyway. I already wrote about the Amida and Shema that um, we should teach them to people. We could teach that to, to the people. He says, but when it comes to shira, when it comes to poetry, we should do that in a language we understand. He says, So we have love, fear, and joy when we pray to God. And he's made the letters Aleph, Yud, and Shin big. And he makes sort of a, I don't know, like a pun on the acronym. Uh, it's Ish, and it's also Shailav Kapecha Lakrif Ishe Hashem. Does this whole thing. I'm not sure if he's also putting in the word Ish here because you'll see that in the next paragraph, he writes about how synagogues have become places that are a balagon. And um, that if a non-Jew would walk into a synagogue and see us praying, they would just think, they, they would think we're insane. Uh, he says that, you know, it's a little like what he's describing, like you might imagine, like sort of shtibol, that everybody, he says, everyone is at their own place and everybody's doing their own thing. And uh, so I wonder if, if what he's doing with this acronym here of Ava, Yira, and Simcha, Aleph, Yud, Shin, which spells Ish, um, is that he's trying to make the argument that when we pray, we need to be an ish, right? Now, that, that was part of the reform argument. We need to be dignified. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a big part of why they wanted the organ. Right? The organ in very early 19th century Europe was, a, was that was how you signified something was a dignified event. Uh, you know, as we read, if it was the king's birthday, if it was a, a public gathering, you would have an organ. I mean, to us, it makes no sense, but that's what it was for them. As the organ was very important in a way that it's really, we can't relate to. Um, but I think that might be what he's getting at here also, is that by changing the language, he doesn't want to change the language for Shema Amida. He is a traditionalist, in my mind. Um, he's not just throwing in his lot with the reform, but but the wanting to have English for Pesukah de Zimra and wanting more structured davening, um, I, th- I think this Ish thing here is a way of of also um, foreshadowing what he's going to say. 
and also us being able to understand where he's coming from. He's not just coming from a place of, uh, you know, I, I, I think we, people have to have better understanding of davening, but he's also, he, he's an orthodox, he's clearly orthodox, as we would call it. Again, his words don't mean much in this time, but, but um, you know, I wouldn't call him a reformer in my mind. I would call him somebody who has a sensitivity to the outside world in his day and doesn't want the Jews to look like backward. You know, that's, it's the difference, uh, and it's that's so crazy, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's the difference between a shul in Brooklyn and a shul in, uh, in Manhattan. You know, it's, there's a certain sensitivity to the outside world um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the structure, the formality, the something that one needs to, to seem, you know, sort of, um, you know, it's like when an Anju walks into show and says, uh, oh, you know, why is everybody talking in services? <laughs> it's nuts to them, right? So if you go into a reform synagogue, nobody talks, right? That's very interesting. It's not like no Orthodox synagogues, people talk. In reform synagogue, nobody talks. It's more formal. Um, and of course, that is on some level the way it should be. It may have come from, you know, a sense of, right? What you have here already is this kind of tension between the outside, they were living in a Protestant world. And um, I saw a book on um, Protestant prayer, and it was saying that the Protestant prayer in Europe at this time, it, everything is out loud. Um, and uh, that's, why there's, that's why they don't want silent prayer. Everything is structured out loud, formulaic. Um, there's a certain dignity to it that they see, um, whereas the Catholics and some others did have silent prayer, but um, the Protestants did not. And, uh, and I think that's partly where the reform uh, is getting it from. But that's an interesting question. In other words, a sensitivity to the outside world, to what it means to be a dignified German in 1810 and 1819, that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, that you're, uh, you know, giving up on orthodoxy. I mean, that's the thing. It's not black and white, right? It's not in the Hassam Sofer's world, it's more black and white. But um, but in, you know, it, it doesn't have to be. I think that's part of. I think that's part of what you have to keep in mind when you read these things. Because we'll, we'll finish his letter, and I want to look at how the Chassam Sofer made him recant, uh, and then what his response to that was. And 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 I think we need to judge. You know, is that valid or not? You know, it, 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 maybe the Chassam Sofer just, you know, he's living in Hungary. I mean, in 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 um, yeah, in Hungary, which is a different world than Germany. Um, and, um, and even though this is a rabbi from Hungary, he clearly has a sense of the German um, Jewish sensitivities uh, that are very different. Okay, we'll uh, see you tomorrow. Have Thank you. Day. Thank you. Thank you.